Hi, I'm Matt Needham. This is my lecture on refrigeration and refrigerants. Let's start off by kind of defining in refrigeration what we mean by high temperature, medium temperature, and low temperature refrigeration. Now in the textbook that we use, sometimes they refer to high temperature refrigeration as air conditioning, but actually throughout the majority of the textbook, it does, and it refers to high temperature refrigeration as products that we keep between 45 degrees Fahrenheit and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. All the romance things, the wine, the flowers, the chocolates, uh, and what have you. Um, and I kind of like that definition, and air conditioning we kind of consider um, to be its own little uh, entity there. And then in medium temperature refrigeration, this is where we keep products just above freezing usually in the 30 degree range, 30 to 40 degrees. Um, and some, a small exception to that might be fresh meats in a supermarket. And if you've done some supermarket uh, work or whatever, you'll understand that we keep the meats at 28 and a half degrees, 29 degrees, and there's salts in the meat that prevent it from freezing until it gets down to 28 degrees Fahrenheit and below. And we want to keep it just there to prevent bacteria growth, make sure the meat is as safe and as appealing as um, possible. Also that 40 degrees, that's where the health department starts generally dinging us at 41 degrees because that's when all the bacteria in any kind of medium temperature product, whether it's eggs or milk or what have you, uh, uh, meat, um, other things, uh, kind of have an orgy and they multiply at much greater rates once the temperature gets to be 41. So that's kind of the idea why we generally keep our products around 35, 37 degrees in medium temperature refrigeration. And then low temperature refrigeration is zero and below, usually to about minus 25. And we like to keep the products generally a couple degrees below zero, negative two degrees Fahrenheit, negative three degrees um, Fahrenheit to keep make sure they're hard, frozen, solid. Um, and so those are kind of the definition when we talk about high, medium, and low temperature uh, refrigeration. And again, we want to emphasize the idea that it's always in refrigeration and air conditioning, heat flowing from a warmer body to a cooler body. And um, we think about a house, if it's the summertime and it's hot outside, and it's 90 degrees and it's 75 inside the house, obviously heat is flowing into the house um, because the house is cooler. Um, and then let's say even that same summer evening, maybe the house is down to 70 and it gets down to 60, 65 degree out, degrees outside, you're gonna lose some heat outside, okay? Um, now, also in your refrigerator, heat is always leaking in. Uh, yes, you might think about heat leaking in when you open the door, or put a warm product inside, gets inside your refrigerator, right? And then refrigeration is remove, taking heat and dumping it to a place we don't care about. So we're always taking the heat from inside your refrigerator and then intensifying it, and we'll talk about that in the compressor, and then dumping it into, let's say, uh, your kitchen. And we can stop a lot of things completely, like light, but we can't fully stop heat. Uh, in fact, the whole universe is trying to become one temperature at this moment. Um, so even when your door is shut on your refrigerator, be assured that heat is leaking from your warmer kitchen through the walls, even though you have a fantastic R50 foam spray insulation in the walls, um, it still leaks in. Uh, and even if your refrigerator or freezer was down to temperature and you unplug it and come back a week later, guess what? And you never opened a door, the freezer would be near the temperature of, let's say, your, your kitchen, okay? Now let's get involved in uh, what we mean by a ton of refrigeration. And you're going to hear a lot of things in this lecture that you probably haven't heard before unless you've taken one of my classes, and this is one of them. What do we mean by a ton of refrigeration? Let's go back in time. 100 years? 105 years? We have an ice company that makes ice for refrigeration, and air conditioning wasn't really anything at, at that point, didn't really exist. 105, 110 years ago, but refrigeration, making ice, selling it for ice boxes and what have you. And we're going to have your buddy uh, take two tons of this ice, 4,000 pounds, and put it on the wagon with his horses and go out into the country and sell two tons of ice. And you, we have this new thing that's called a truck. 
and we're going to put one ton of ice or 2,000 pounds on that, and you're going to drive through the city streets and sell it in blocks. So that's kind of where the idea of a ton of refrigeration comes in, and it's the amount of heat required to melt 2,000 pounds of ice, how much heat do you have to add to, let's even just say 32 degrees ice to turn it into 32 degrees water, and the math on that is 144 BTUs per pound, which is the latent heat of fusion that you have to add to a pound of ice, 144 BTUs, times um, uh, to get it to change into a pound of water. And then uh, if we were to multiply that times the 2,000, we'll get 288,000 BTUs or British thermal units and if you were to divide that by 24, you get 12,000. So that's why, or how we came up with 12,000 BTUs equals a ton of refrigeration. A, a lot of times a small normal window unit is a one ton unit. Like this could almost be considered a window unit on our uh, refrigeration cycle diagram here. And that unit, takes 12,000 BTUs an hour and dumps it outside. Or it takes 288,000 BTUs if it ran consistently for 24 hours and dumps it outside. And let's say you were renting a place and you just decided, you know what, I'm not getting a paycheck, COVID-19, blah, 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 blah. I'm not paying my rent. And they're gonna, and pretty soon you just, you know, you actually get to a point where you have no electricity or whatever, they cut the electricity off, but you're staying there and you say, well, I'm gonna buy some ice, I'm gonna get a, a little kitty swimming pool and I'm gonna get 2,000 pounds of ice delivered and stuck in this little doughboy swimming pool. And if you did that, it's exactly like running your window unit for 24 hours straight. If you take 2,000 pounds of ice and put in there, pretty much the same thing. So that's kind of how people always say, well, where did they get a ton from? It's the amount of heat to melt 2,000 pounds of ice and actually comes back to the days of ice boxes and the early 1900s, uh, et cetera. So there's your history lesson for the day. Now, um, what is a refrigerant? A refrigerant is a substance that boils at a low pressure and a low temperature and condenses or turns from a vapor to a liquid at a high pressure and a high temperature. Um, right here we have a jug of R22, refrigerant 22, which is a common and older refrigerant, um, which is still out there. Uh, and I still love R R22 because it's the only one that can do it all, freezers, medium temperature, and air conditioning, but it is being phased out now because of some environmental concerns. So, but inside of here, while I have it up, I'll, I'll do a little bit of mini lecture. This is a sealed cylinder. Here's the valve on top. And right now, if this cylinder is at 70 degrees, the pressure in here is about 121 pounds per square inch gauge. If I put a torch on the bottom of this and heated it up, the pressure would rise up over 200 PSI. On the other hand, if I put this in a bucket of ice, the pressure would drop down to uh, 70 PSIG or lower. And uh, actually, if you take my lab classes, when we get back to normal, we do a lot of these experiments with uh, different refrigerants. So in here is a refrigerant and it's a fluid. And when we say a fluid, fluid means flow. Vapor can flow, liquid can flow, and that's what we have going through the refrigeration cycle is refrigerants, different ones, and each refrigerant, like this is R22, it has a green cylinder, 410A, is pink or rose, 134A is light blue, and so forth. Um, and they're used for different applications, and they absorb heat easily, and they give off heat easily, and they boil and condense at appropriate temperatures and pressures. Now, one of the things you have to, well, I'll do a Yoda. You must first unlearn what you have learned. Is when you think about boiling, forget about it being hot, okay? I've taken a regular bottle of water, like in a sparklets bottle, and made it boil at 70 degrees Fahrenheit by putting it in a bell jar, removing all the air off the top, and then it starts to boil. Um, so, 
and again with water, let's think about water as a refrigerant to understand our refrigerants like R22. We know that water boils at 212 degrees if you're sitting at the beach. Atmospheric pressure. If you went to Denver, Colorado, it boils closer to 205 degrees. There's less air pressure holding it down, so it takes less heat for the molecules to become free. Right? Mount Everest, uh, 180 degrees. You're getting closer to outer space now, and uh, instead of 14.696 pressure on the water at sea level, now you only have eight pounds of pressure, and it's going to be boiling at 180 degrees, right? Or you take water and put it in a pressure cooker and raise the pressure above the water to 15 PSI. It boils at 250 degrees. So the boiling point of all the substances changes with pressure. And we found out that, like with R22, um, if you went into a freezer and you cut the top off that cylinder and it was minus 50 degrees in this special freezer, and you then shut the freezer off and it warmed up to negative 41, it would then start to boil. So just like water boils at atmospheric pressure at 212, R22 boils at negative 41 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, makes it um, very useful as a refrigerant. And a lot of the refrigerants boil, most of the refrigerants boil at a negative temperature at atmospheric pressure, um, some just above. Now, uh, Let's um, now consider uh, the refrigeration cycle that we have here, and you're going to hear it a little differently. You may think you know the refrigeration cycle, but this is actually different maybe than what you've heard, and it's drawn a little different than what you've seen before or what you can get on the computer online or in your textbook. Notice some quick differences here, even if you think you know. Notice the condenser is bigger than the evaporator, which is always the case because of heat of compression. Notice what is the biggest line in any system? It is the suction line, the smallest line, the liquid line, and the one that's in between the two sizes is the discharge line. So those are some of the things that make my cycle a little different. So again, it's all about picking up heat and dumping it where we don't care about. So if this was like a window unit, and this part is the part that sticks inside the the coil there, if you take remove your filter, you'll see something that looks like this, like a radiator coil. And the heat from the room might be 75 degrees. And when the system's running, and we have to start somewhere, so we'll say this coil is cold at, let's say, 40 degrees. And the heat in the room at 75 gives up its heat to that cold coil, OK? And when it gives up its heat to the cold coil, that 75 degree air, the air comes off at like 55 degrees or 50 degrees, okay? Well, why doesn't it come off at 40 degrees if it's touching the 40 degree coil? It's a function of time. It's the air flowing by there and it hits the coil and it says you need to have a certain amount of airflow and um, it has to also be a certain temperature. So as the air flows by, it only has so much time to get cold. And if we restricted it by causing a dirty air filter, it would actually come out even colder, but you have you wouldn't have enough airflow. Okay, that's a, an interesting point. And so we're absorbing heat in the evaporator, okay, on this cold coil. And it's at a, and the refrigerant is at a low pressure and a low temperature. We said that the refrigerant here at this point is 40 degrees, right? And then the part of the window unit, let's say, that sticks out of your house. That's where we want to dump the heat. It has the compressor and the condenser in it. And um, the compressor and the condenser are going to get rid of the heat. First of all, the compressor takes that heat and intensifies it. It compresses it. So the evaporator, it does what it says it does. It's evaporating refrigerant. The refrigerant comes in as a liquid, a low pressure liquid, and with a little bit, poquito vapor, and it as absorbs the heat, it completely turns into a vapor. The compressor sucks this vapor, think of like a piston, sucking the vapor into it, and then it squeezes it or compresses it. So look at my hands now, and if you have vapor in there bouncing around, and then you squeeze it into a smaller area, the molecules are moving faster. Faster means hotter. And since you're jamming more molecules into a smaller area, 
and they're bouncing off each other, the pressure goes up. So the job of the compressor is to raise the pressure of the refrigerant and the temperature. So as you go through here, you compress, you compress the refrigerant vapor and squeeze it into a smaller space. And remember the discharge line is smaller than the suction line, right? And you've now picked up the heat here, intensified it in the compressor, and then your discharge line, it's hot. The refrigerant flows as a high pressure, high temperature vapor down the discharge line to the condenser. Think about again your window unit or maybe uh, the back of an old refrigerator that has a grill that looks something like that. And you'll see these fins and if you ever feel the air coming off of it, and you should be looking to put your hand on the condenser air all day long from now on, um, you'll feel the warm air coming off of it because it's dumping the heat from inside to outside. And then when we dump the heat, we take the uh, refrigerant and it condenses from a vapor and it turns itself since we got it, uh, we remove the heat into a liquid. And then it flows down the smallest of the three lines, the liquid line, as a high pressure, warmish liquid. And then we flow to the metering device. There's different kinds of metering devices, thermostatic expansion valve. For this illustration, we're using a capillary tube or a cap tube as a type of metering device, and I've colored it purple here so you can see it. And as the refrigerant flows through here, it goes through a tiny hole, a tiny orifice. And because it does that, it drops the pressure. And since, and then we've already gotten rid of the heat here, it lowers the boiling point of the refrigerant and some of it, the refrigerant turns into vapor. And in that liquid turning some of itself into vapor, the whole compound gets kind of cold. It gets actually very cold. And then this low pressure liquid with a little bit of vapor flows through the evaporator. And again, it's gonna absorb the heat. It's gonna absorb the heat of whatever we're trying to cool down. That air from our house coming into the evaporator coil, it's gonna absorb that heat and the refrigerant's gonna boil off into 100% vapor. The compressor sucks that vapor from the suction line, gives it an honorable discharge, out the discharge line right? It's very hot, high pressure, high temperature vapor, flows to the condenser, gives off heat, it condenses into a liquid, okay? And then it flows down the liquid line, all right? So we're just trying to transfer heat from here and dump it outside. From your refrigerator, there's in the back of your refrigerator freezer, there is an evaporator in there behind the panel, and it's there to absorb the heat from the air in your refrigerator freezer and the products, and then it intensifies it, usually underneath, and dumps it out the bottom of your refrigerator through the condenser. It's about moving heat around. I like to uh, give them some personality. We have the evaporator. It's like the prima donna. It's the star. I have my personal assistant. Everything is filtered through my personal assistant to filter before it can get to me. I'm very cool, you know. Then you got the loud bully pushing everybody around, the compressor, huh? Then you kind of got like the garbage man out here, you're like doing all the dirty work, getting rid of the heat, no credit, you know, no filter, getting real dirty out in the doghouse, dumping the heat, okay, unprotected. And then it flows over to our magician. I magically make it cold and very people really understand what I do and I am the magician. And uh, I think my favorite is, is the condenser because of that. And the magician is, is second favorite for me of, of the four components. And if you can put a personality to these things, you're going to remember it a little bit better. Now, I'm going to go over it again here in more detail in a minute, add a few little things like superheat and subcooling. Um, I know that may have been hard for you to understand, and I recommend that you watch this over again. The first time I heard this, I was 17 years old. And I don't think it was presented very well to me at all. And uh, I heard it, and I, I, yeah, I don't get it. And I heard it again, and yeah, I still don't get it. And again, and again, and I've done this presentation thousands of times now, believe it 
or not thousands of times. And so I'm trying to get better at it. I don't know, maybe I'll perfect it before I finally kick the refrigeration bucket. So um, this is again uh, a graphical image of the refrigeration cycle. Uh, if you think about a condensing unit, the part that sits outside your house, if you have a central air conditioner, um, the part that sits outside that box that has two pipes going to it, the condensing unit consists of the compressor and the evaporator and then, I'm sorry, the compressor and the condenser, the evaporator may be sitting on top of your furnace um, if you have a split system. And the metering device is always very close to our evaporator in every case, air conditioning, refrigeration. The only time that it may actually go between the two more like this is on a ductless mini split, but that's the story for another day. So let's go over it again and add superheat and subcooling just to get an introduction to what those concepts are. First of all, superheat is the number of degrees above the boiling point. Superheat is the number of degrees above the boiling point. Also, we say the number of degrees above saturation. Let's think about that for a minute. Um, if we take water and we boil it at 212, okay, and to steam, and then we heat that steam to 222 degrees, we can say we have 222 degrees superheated steam. And that's the origin of superheat. It's not refrigerants. It's steam engines. It's 1820. It's trains. Um, superheated steam. That's where the concept comes from. And then superheat made its way later, 100 years later, more into refrigeration and then air conditioning. Um, so it's the number of degrees above the boiling point, right? And again, if we had 312 degrees steam, we can say the steam is 100 degrees superheated, okay? If you have water that's a little bit warm, it's 100 degrees, and you're going to take a sip of this tepid water, you can say that the water you're drinking is 112 degrees subcooled water. People say to me, if I'm drinking a bottle, what are you, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm, I'm drinking 132 degrees subcooled water. What are you doing? You know, so it kind of changes uh, the way you look at things. So subcooling is the number of degrees below the boiling point, below the saturation, superheat above. So keep that in mind, okay? So again, let's think about our low pressure, low temperature, liquid refrigerant with a little bit of vapor traveling into our evaporator. And what's it doing? It's absorbing heat, okay? Now, the compressor is there to compress vapor. And it can do that, but you can't compress a liquid. So we need to have an insurance policy, like let's really make sure, you know what? We don't have any liquid in there. So we make sure that we have some superheat. So as the refrigerant travels through here, it's turning more and more as it's absorbing heat into a vapor until it gets to about right here. It becomes 100% vapor. And then the last little bit of the evaporator, it adds superheat. So again, I was telling you the evaporator is 40 degrees and the refrigerant is boiling, boiling off at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you measure 50 degrees Fahrenheit here, we can say that we have 10 degrees of superheated vapor. The compressor sucks that refrigerant from the suction line, discharges it, honorable discharge, out the discharge line, that's hot. And now you have this high pressure, really superheated, super superheated uh, vapor coming out. And as it travels down the discharge line, it's cooling off even before it gets to the condenser. And then as you travel through the condenser, it starts to condense and turns more and more here it might be 50% vapor, 50% liquid. Here, 100% liquid. And then you remove some more heat. So it may be uh, turned to 100% liquid at, let's say, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? And then you remove a little bit more heat from it. And then over here on the liquid line, if you measured 80 degrees, you now have 20 degrees of subcooling. 20 degrees of subcooling, and then you come back to the liquid line, and then the cycle um, repeats. A couple more points on refrigerants. They have to be safe and detectable. 
um, safe in that if you get a whiff of refrigerant, nothing's bad is really going to happen to you. It's sort of like breathing a, a strong cleaning fluid, um, like a Windex or something like that. Um, except for like mainly ammonia, which is toxic and can cause you burns or kill you if you have enough. I've, I got some, somebody opened a jug in front of me once. I got a little bit of an irrit, I got a little bit of a burn irritation in my nose, uh, and throat for three days. Didn't miss any work. Um, and they have to be safe for people. And that's kind of why we got these modern refrigerants. They also have to now be safe for the environment. Originally, a lot of the great refrigerants that they first made safe, R12, R11, and now R22, to a lesser extent, damaged the ozone layer. So the, the world got together and did a good job and said we need to protect the ozone layer. We need to make refrigerants that don't have that chlorine atom in them. And we've done that, and we've moved to new refrigerants like R134A, and 410A and 404A. Uh, and these refrigerants do not home harm the ozone layer. However, these refrigerants do contribute to global warming. So now we're looking at trying to come up with new refrigerants um, that also don't really contribute much to global warming. So in that regard, refrigerants have to be safe, not only for people, but also for the environment. Also refrigerants need to be detectable so we can find leaks um, so that they can be re repaired. Also in the book, it talks a little bit about the Molière pressure enthalpy diagram. Um, after dealing with that for 30 years, I thought, yeah, I never used it on a roof. And uh, it was really important for uh, an engineer to have, to design, to pick a refrigerant in the 1930s, but no more. And uh, if you have an evil instructor that makes you do that, well, I'm sorry. Um, have them contact me and we can debate it. I'll be happy to do that as far as the benefits of a technician getting really good with the Molier diagram. I do teach it briefly to help students, but I color coat everything in the diagram this way so that people understand what the lines are. Um, so anyway, it's not a fan of that because uh, I, I think it was child abuse because I was 17 and they made me do it five hours a day, five days a week when I was a student learning the trade. So perhaps this is just my therapy. All right, well, that's enough of that. And that concludes my lecture on refrigeration and refrigerants.